guest today is Terrence Dorsey. Terrence, how you doing? I'm good. It's great to meet you. Great to meet you. And I really enjoyed your talk this morning on uh, writing, writing for bloggers, right? What was, what was it called? I was, the talk I gave today was called Writing About Code. Mm -hmm. I think it was mostly aimed towards bloggers, but the... You're, you're a blogger, right? I am a career technical writer and editor. I have <coughs> done some blogging. I do some occasional blogging. I also write newsletters, uh, curate news for software developers. I was, I guess we get into my background. I was the technical editor of MSDN Magazine for a number of years. More recently, I was the director of content development for the Code Project. Mm -hmm. So I've done many different things regarding words and engineering and programming, okay. although I never quite became very adept at the programming part of it <laughs> myself. Uh, but it's fa fair to say you've done a lot of technical writing and you've reviewed and edited a lot of technical writing. That's correct. I've worked with most of the big well-known writers in the .NET space uh, over the years and worked on a couple of books about Microsoft technologies. Mm -hmm. And more recently, I've been getting more interested in uh, iOS programming. Mm -hmm. So delving into that somewhat, getting to know the writers in that space. Okay. Um, let's talk about uh, just writing in general and what, what uh, things to keep in mind. Because that was part of your talk was... Uh, um, just some general rules of being a better writer. That's right. I think we can really sum it down to my one key f slide, which I put it probably should have just put up on, on the board and left, <laughs> which is the number one thing that keeps people from being good writers is not writing. Mm. And my, my main advice to people who would like to write about any subject, but code and coding in particular is just to start writing every day even a little bit and they'll start to develop skills as a writer and confidence as a writer mm -hmm. uh, which I think will get them to keep doing it yeah and I think that's um, I learned this a long time ago there's a myth that great writers are born or uh, even good writers are born I think there's a little bit of truth of that not everyone is going to be able to be Ernest Hemingway but that doesn't mean if you're a bad writer, you can't become a good writer. If you're a good writer, you can't become a great writer. Uh, it's, it may be That's impossible true. for bad writers to become great writers, but you can always improve it. It is a skill, and a skill that can be learned, and a skill that can be improved with practice. That's right. I think that if you saw the galley drafts, you saw the first drafts of some of the most famous novels and the, the most famous writers, you'd be aghast really? at what w they submitted. And like I said, I've worked with some some very well-known writers in the industry, people, um, I won't name names, and their first drafts of the articles that they submitted were not, they're good, they're technically full of inf good information, but they're not the finished product that you saw in the magazine. Um, there is only one or two writers that I can think of off the top of my head who what, what they submit is publishable more or less. Uh, okay. as it, that's out of I, I'm not kidding, probably thousands of people I've worked with in my career. Is the problem that uh, they're just not using good grammar or they're uh, not using good style? Or what is the problem? Well, I don't know. I think one of the issues that we run into is the people that we work with are professional programmers. Mm -hmm. And their expertise is programming, and they do it every day for years on end, because they enjoy it, but the result is that they they develop skill. Mm. I would say also that sticking on the, c the programming side of things, I don't think people write code the first time that's perfect. Oh, so they're, they're just not, they haven't practiced it enough, and so that's why. That's right, well also I think the, I think the expectation that what you do the first time out even if it's professional, even if you've been doing it, is perfect. And that it has to be in order for other people to appreciate it. Mm, okay. The, if you stopped coding when the first time the compiler spit an error at you, 
you'd never get any better. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, it's a silly example, of course, because programming is all trial and error, particularly exactly. as fast as compilers work today. Exactly. A lot of, uh, like I said, I'm not a particularly good programmer, but I do know that when I learn something new, a lot of times I just write some code and see what happens and yep. see what error gets thrown back at me yep. and then try again. That's perfectly and that's how I learn. Doing it, so. And we start with small programs. Mm -hmm. I gave the, uh, the example of Hello World. Everybody knows Hello World, which is silly when you think about it. But we move on to bigger and better, better things. Right. And we never go on to the next step without more errors mm -hmm. and more confusion and more time spent going back through our code. And the same is true with writing, I think. We start off with a small piece. My, my recommendation was 500 words. Aim for that or a half an hour or whatever somebody's comfortable with. And then we move on to just writing that. It doesn't matter if it's correct or not. Mm -hmm. And then writing it, then going back and, and looking at it and making it better. And each step along the way, we develop some more skills. We develop some more, um, an eye for what works and what doesn't. Most of it's just, uh, with writing, most of it's just becoming comfortable with the, with the practice, the discipline of writing. We're doing it every day. All right. So, so practice is uh, definitely a good thing. You know, Malcolm Gladwell says, let's get 10,000 hours in before we're any good at anything. <laughs> but, I, uh, I, I, and that's, that's part of that. My, my experience says that there's something to that. What's, um, is there any uh, specific tips that we can give to people that they can take advantage of tomorrow that would just make their writing better than it is today if they're, if they're inexperienced? Well, like I said, I think the first thing to do is to, ri is to write. Right. Make time out of every day. Assume they're, they're, they're d started doing that, but what what should they be focusing on while they're writing in order to make their editor's job easier? The next step, I would say, is what I talked about today is to write a complete piece, no matter how long you want it to be. Write it through all the way the first time and get out of the habit of stopping and starting and stopping and sta starting and agonizing over a sentence or agonizing over a spelling error mm. or these things are all distractions that yeah. keep us from getting from the beginning to the end. Right. So write a full draft, go back and then reread it and then think about what did I leave out? What logical leaps did I make that I need to go back and fix? What details do I need to fill in or double check? That point is a good time to do a spell check. Um, and maybe to have a, a friend read the article and give some feedback, some constructive feedback. Uh, those are all great steps forward. Get a dictionary. That's uh, advice that my uh, I uh, took a writing class in college and my professor suggested. He said, getting words on paper is the easy part. And convince yourself of that. Just get everything out. It could be all spelled wrong. It could be run on sentences. That's okay. Just get the ideas on paper, knowing that you're going to come back and, exactly. and prove it later and then do the hard part, do the rigorous part of this thing. And people get stuck on that. Um, and you're saying you should also all do it all in one sitting. Don't, don't start and stop. And I think that, like you said, getting the – personally for me, getting the words onto the paper the first time or onto the screen as it may be. Yeah. I went is, to college a long time ago. Is the most important. Well, we both remember the old typewriter days, but it's easier, but it's also harder because it's easy to get distracted by the browser or by Twitter or by doing some research. Guilty. Or <laughs> a million different things yeah. get in the way. Well, and I'm just I, getting stuck on a sentence and thinking, I have to get this sentence exactly. perfect before I move to the next one. To me, it's far easier to get procrastinating and not get anything written. Or to stop and, and, and not get re started again. If I write as much as possible in one sitting, that's the hard part. Going on and, and double checking my, the, the facts, I don't even worry about if what I'm writing about is true or technically accurate. Or if I, if I do have questions, I don't stop. I'll make a note to myself and say, research this 
or double check this or is that really how it works? But I don't stop. I keep going. And I've written some real doozies that don't make any sense, but it's done. The second part, going back, looking on Facebook, you know, not Facebook, excuse me, <laughs> looking in Wikipedia, looking in the documentation, looking in the dictionary, looking at other articles to see, well, what, what, uh, why is this? Mm -hmm. What's the background information? That's actually really easy and fun. It's also a way to get down the rabbit hole doing some research. But if I've, I've already written something and then I'm doing that distracting work, I already have something to show for it and I'm motivated to finish it. Right. Whereas if I do the research, if I go down the Wikipedia rabbit hole first, well, I've got nothing to show for it but a full browser history. Is there anything uh, in particular about technical writing, writing about code that you can share with us? Well, as I said, the technical details of it, I'll leave for the experts. I think... So everything you've said so far would apply to writing about anything, writing fiction. I think every bit of advice you've given so far would apply to a novelist or a journalist I, I think so. or a uh, blogger or writer of a technical book. That's right. In th with code, it's really the same thing. You're writing about something that you have expertise about. Um, the details of it, are up to the individual writer. I would say that you're, when you're writing about something, presumably you're writing about something you care about, have some passion about, a problem that you solved that you're proud of, uh, or a problem that you solved and you couldn't find, you had to figure out the answer for yourself. You couldn't just find somebody else's article about it. Mm -hmm. You're enthusiastic about a new product or a new technology or a new language many things like that. You're basically just sharing your own enthusiasm and uh, your own hardware and expertise on, some, on a subject. There are a lot of other people who don't have that expertise. You went out, you found it, you solved a problem, you were excited about it enough to write some code and now you want to write about it. You have just made yourself the expert on, the, on that subject. Mm -hmm. There are a ton of other people out there who don't know that they didn't solve your problem and they want they want to learn about it they want they share your enthusiasm and they share your curiosity you have something to give back to them the technical details about it are each article is different what, whatever people are interested in I would say I think I gave the example that w just to get in the practice of doing it you might want to just take a piece of a big chunk of code might have been your code that you wrote might be somebody else's code, maybe some open source internals, and go through it and explain it to somebody who doesn't understand the code uh, to understand the how and the why of how it works. It's a great way of not only developing your chops as a writer, but also developing your chops as a, a thinker and developing your background as a technologist. You get a lot more out of it in the end, and so does so do your readers. So you're saying write for yourself. Think about yourself first and uh, write what's interesting to you. I think so. More, more than uh, picking the audience. And now, there is a – we didn't talk about this in the presentation. There is a commercial side of the industry. There are people who get paid to write technical documentation, SDKs, how-to information. Um, there is – there are professional reasons for doing it. Um, there are technical writers. That's what I used to do. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we don't get to do exactly what we're enthusiastic about, but we take it. We take the same approach. We learn about the subject. We figure out why it's important. I suppose this gets into something else that's important. Is se setting up the introduction to your work is to explain the context, why it's important, and then what you're going to tell people about it. Um, I think that's valid for for any sort of technical writing, even if it's documentation for a program. Right. What does the program do? Why do I care? What problem does it solve? And now I'm going to explain to you how to solve that problem with this product. What about uh, style? Um, is there a particular style that we should be working towards as a technical writer? 
or are, do we have the freedom to choose what our writer's voice is going to be uh, as, for example, if we're writing for the Atlantic or writing short fiction or something like that? That's a great question because I think it holds up people from doing actual writing. Both experienced writers who feel like they should have a style and new writers who feel like they either ought to have it, it would be if they were a good writer, or should develop it so people to differentiate themselves. I think that comes with experience, and I don't think that people should worry about it actively. I, I believe it's one of those distractions from writing. And in fact, there's an argument to be, to be made for keeping your writing as clear and simple and concise as possible because if you agonize over long convoluted sentences or stylistic elements, you're distracting yourself from the actual writing. And we're talking about a technical subject. We're not talking about the great American novel in this particular sense. And it serves the largest audience the best if you're clear and straightforward in your writing style. And the simple construction, simple straightforward style. Partly because a significant, about a significant part of your audience doesn't speak English as its native language. Mm. So you have uh, people speaking um, English as a second language who might not have a great grasp of idiom and long sentence and complicated sentence constructions, compound sentences. Mm -hmm. You also have the, the issue of uh, translation software, which people can use. And that works very well in many cases, but it does trip up over convoluted sentence constructions and compound sentences. Okay. So the more straightforward your sentences are, the easier it is for the translation software to work. I think so. It's a it's kind of a sideline, um, and again, it shouldn't be a distraction. But I think getting distracted about style and fancy writing mm -hmm. is keeps people from actually doing the writing. I find that uh, when I write, my my writer's voice is very different from my spoken voice. Mine it is too. It is more straightforward. At least I strive for that. It is less less funny because of course I'm very funny in real life you are it's true <laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, so you think this is okay Th this is uh, I shouldn't strive for uh, to emulate myself on the page and the uh, humor is like probably a, a good one here do I should I try to be funny on the page assuming uh, that I'm actually funny in real I life? don't think you should try to be funny it's a uh, in writing there are people who can pull it off they've worked long and hard at it and comedy is serious business. It's a serious business. And the and if you want to see how serious it is, little tangent, the Jerry Seinfeld movie Comedian is is a great way to see how hard they work at it. I haven't seen that. I'll check it out. It's very good. The um the problem is we're talking about if you want to be a comedy writer, then be a comedy writer. That's fine. And you but you will have to deal with the repercussions of that. Because comedy is often about poking fun at people and things mm. uh, about talking about things that we don't want to talk about. The problem is we're talking about code and we want people to read our writing about code yeah. and code isn't sometimes funny, but it's usually not, especially when it's not running correctly. <laughs> and humor is a distraction. Okay. Not everybody shares the same sense of, sense of humor and not everybody th thinks that the same thing that, how, how should I rephrase this? I'll rephrase this. What some people think is funny is offensive to other people. Mm -hmm. And to other people is just not funny and is just, why is this person, it makes you sound dumb sometimes. Right. I think that it's better to, to be light but to be, stick to the point. Okay, fair enough. It's harder also to, re to read your audience over a written page because there's this time disconnect. There is a time g disconnect. Uh, cultural references fall into that same oh issue. Yeah, culture and the language uh, barriers you talked about earlier as well. Right. 
Um, and also what people, you could talk about what was on TV or one of the examples is I could talk about us talking here at Code Camp and that doesn't make any sense to anybody who, if I wrote about it, granted they'll see us here in the video, but if I write about it, the context of Code Camp doesn't make sense to anybody who wasn't there. Yeah. Better for me to just get to the point and tell them what it was that I was interested in writing about mm. and um, get to the point. Yeah, well, what's more, be very direct in your writing. I think so. Yeah. Um, switch topics real quick. Uh, what's um, What about comments on a blog? You told me you disable comments on your blog. Uh, that is a... That is a, t a subject. It's a touchy subject for people. Well, should everyone disable comments on their blog? In your opinion? Not necessarily. I think there are very there are people who are very strong advocates for blog comments, and there are people who are very strong advocates against blog comments, and I think both camps have good arguments. What was yours? Why did you disable comments? I, in my personal experience, I've never had. Uh, a following of people who contributed in the comments in a way that made them worthwhile to me versus the hassle, expense, and ongoing maintenance of s filtering spam and random comments out. And I try to keep, my personal blogs are very, very, very simple static blogs that are easy for me to maintain and I post what I personally am interested on them. I provide on my blog ways for people to get in touch with me if they want to. I have a comment email form. My Twitter account is linked. People can get in touch with me if they have feedback, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to do it. And in fact, I've, on a few rare occasions, gotten some good feedback, and I've gone back and changed my blog post to represent new information that came in. Okay. But on the other side of the issue is the people who do like comments. I think we know there are bloggers out there who have very interesting followers who comment regularly on the blogs and the comments are often as interesting, sometimes more interesting, yeah. than the blog posts themselves. And they're happy to put up with the, the costs. What I see as costs are just business for them and they get it done. Yeah, some people are it. good at uh, engaging a uh, community around their blog That's posts. right. Uh, I found on my blog um, that uh, by far the most common type of comment is spam. I really enjoyed this article. You explained it really well, just some generic thing that I won't delete and then I'd link to buy some handbags somewhere. Right. Um, and so I, I, it's, I think I'm, I may be turning off comments just for that reason. It's so hard to filter through all those. I... It's a, it's, it's, there's a cost involved in it. Yeah. I think we also talked a little bit to get into a controversial subject is some people get abusive comments. Right. And I get a few of those. And those, I don't get a lot of them, but they're discouraging. It is discouraging. It's not cool. And what, what do we do? The other side of it is I like constructive feedback. Mm -hmm. And if I could get more constructive feedback, it would help me know what people like me to write about and what people like me about my writing or dislike. Not all of it has to be positive. In fact, I appreciate when people point out things that I could do better. Um, when they do it in a non-personal, constructive way, it's better. Yeah. But I think one of the things I said was that for all the years I've been doing this, I've only worked with a professional editor for my writing very, very briefly mm. for maybe six months. And it was pure heaven. I loved it. Mm. And it was great to get a professional person giving me insight and feedback and correcting my spelling and grammar <laughs> so I didn't have to. Well, F7 does most of that, right? <laughs> and it does, but uh, it was great, and I was fortunate to work with a very good editor. Ah. And, um, but we don't always have that, so I love... I do like to get feedback when I can. Mm -hmm. But when it becomes like these ad hominem attacks that sometimes... I, I tell you what, uh, the so one of um, uh, my favorite bloggers is Scott Hanselman, outstanding communicator, both verbally and written, and he gets attacked sometimes on sure. his, in his blog posts, and uh, it bothers him. He, he, he's not shy about 
putting that out there that, hey, this really was hurtful. I don't know why people are doing this. And here's someone who gets a lot of positive reinforcement. Right. He, he must know that he's very good at what he does, and yet it still hurts him uh, when that happens. And so right. it, I, I admit it hurts me as well when that happens to me. I think, to put it all in context, though, uh, I was this was something we talked about at the end of my presentation today. And as I said earlier, I was not super happy about closing on the topic of abusive blog comments. Because it's a negative way to close? I, because I didn't want people to feel like that's, well, if you blog, you're going to have to deal with this. The reality is actually different. Scott Hanselman has spent a lot of time and a lot of effort being a very public evangelist right. and developing a following. He writes, as I said, one of the good ways to get followers is to write regularly, which he does. And the reality for most of us is we don't have that many followers. Right. I, I've been doing this on and off for a lot of years. Nobody reads my blog. Like in the grand scheme of things. Well, that's going to change now because literally tens of people are watching this. Is, this is, and I'm going to have to up my Linode level <laughs> to run it. But the, the reality is, it's a, I guess you could say it's a good problem to have. And the more important thing I would want to emphasize is that you can't have that problem without doing a lot of writing first. And a lot of writing about in a way that makes people sit up and take notice of your writing. So I, don't, I wouldn't wish that problem on anyone, but if you do find that you have that problem of many commenters and abusive commenters, and it's probably because you've sat down and you wrote diligently and expanded your horizons as a, as a programmer and expanded your horizons as a writer and actually engaged an audience. So you're cool. saying it's a compliment to get that kind of I attack. suppose that's the way to that being read I suppose it's probably not fun when you're in the in the middle of it, yeah. but I think that's I think that's a one way to look that at it. That would be the rational way of looking at it. Right. It's hard to do that though, as I said, when you get some emotional attack like that. It's sort of like I don't I'm not a common I don't commonly speak at events like this. Mm -hmm. But I decided to get up and it was a little anxiety producing. Sure. But what's the worst that could happen? I get up in front of and make a fool of myself. Not too likely. I get, well, I don't know. No, I was there. It was good. And uh, But I could just, all I had to do was talk for an hour about a subject that I've been doing for 20 years and presumably know something about. Yep. What, uh, let's wrap up. What's, um, where can people read your writing? I blog at terrencedorsey.com. I also have an even more ignored blog than that called thesportwagon.com where I write about my uh, my side interest in automotive issues and motorsports. Wow. And there's a car show in town today. I know there's a big car show in town today. And uh, I've written on the code project, but mostly I would say I've linked up most of what I've written all over the net on my blog. And people can go there and find out more about me, find my Twitter account. I, tw I tweet more. It's What's a good Twitter account? Uh, T.P. Dorsey. Uh, it's, that's actually where I spend most of my wasted hours. <laughs> Terrence, thanks so much. Thank you. It was great to talk to you. I don't always write about technology, but when I do, I share it with my friends, and so should you.